brand owners and agency owners, what do brand owners really want? One of the areas of possible friction in those relationships is the whole area of transparency. And the WFA have been doing some research on uh, transparency, people's attitudes towards transparency, and that's going to be the subject of our next session. It will be um, a panel session, but we're going to start off with the report back and some of that research. Somewhere out there in the dark, I think, is Rob Drebro, who is the Marcoms Director of WFCA, at WFA. Please welcome him to the stage, and he's going to share with us his findings. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but uh, it feels like for a uh, festival of media, we've not had enough confusing charts over the last few presentations. So I'm here to change all of that. Um, very briefly, for those of you who don't know who the WFA is, uh, we represent advertisers. So our membership is made up of 55 national advertiser associations, as you see here, including ISBA in the UK, UDA in France, uh, ANA in the US, uh, ABBA in Brazil, the list goes on. Um, and we're also proud to count uh, 70 of the world's largest multinationals uh, in our membership. And many of those companies take part in our peer-to-peer -peer groups, one of which is called the Media Committee. And you're going to hear today from three global media directors who sit on that Media Committee. And it's our members who really asked us to raise this issue with you here today and raise the profile uh, of transparency uh, concerns uh, at an industry level. So we're really here to start that conversation. Uh, and as was just shared, we sat down with our friends at the Festival of Media uh, and we conducted some research. Uh, and we had 70 responses, a mix of uh, agency leaders, and thank you very much for those of you who did take part, uh, and also uh, global media directors, much as those you're going to see on the panel today. And the first question we asked was, uh, what's the biggest issue in relation to media transparency today? And as you'd imagine, there were many responses that came back. But I think really uh, three areas broadly that came out. Uh, the first are rebates, AVBs, they have lots of different names, but uh, let's call them rebates for the sake of uh, today's discussion. The second is measurement. So not just uh, media audience measurement, but also in terms of uh, verification of delivery. I'm thinking of ad serving. And the final one, which I think was described yesterday as a bit of a red herring, was uh, a trading desk. So newer, if you like, to this debate. And we're going to touch on all of those areas uh, when we have our discussion afterwards. So I'm just going to take three minutes to give you a bit of context uh, in terms of the findings that we had back from, uh, from that research. And the first question that we asked really demonstrates there's plenty of common ground, obviously. It would be bizarre if there weren't. But the first statement we ask you to see on the bottom is advertisers have the right to know the actual costs charged by media owners to third parties, i.e. their agencies. So as you can see here, the red line, advertisers, funnily enough, 100% agreeing with that. And the vast majority of agencies saying, yeah, absolutely, that's the case. So 92% responding and saying, yes, they agree. But a slightly more contentious statement that we put out for them to, uh, for our, uh, our respondents to come back to us on were, Agency fees fall uh, as agency profits rise. This demonstrates that agencies and media owners are being less transparent. Now, uh, obviously our first disconnect that we see in terms of 88% of the advertisers saying they agreed with that statement and 17% of agencies saying they agreed. Now, now, just to clarify, none of our members that I'm aware of have any issues with agencies uh, making a profit. Quite the opposite. Uh, they're very keen to see their agency partners succeed in this space. But the, I think this sort of disconnect really uh, warrants discussion and more clarity in terms, of, um, in terms of where the remuneration is coming from. And in part, I think that takes us back to uh, uh, AVBs and, and rebates. And here you see uh, what we call our, our heat map, um, it's, which we prepared for our members. And this is just Europe, we did it globally. Uh, but it's just really an opportunity to sort of say, where do your peers feel that rebates are highest around the world? But obviously the level of rebates are not the issue we're facing. None of our members, again, I think have any issue with rebates. The problem comes down to the hidden rebates uh, and the ones that actually aren't made clear and uh, open with, uh, with the advertiser, with the agency's clients. But on the flip side of that discussion, again, in the third statement you see on the far right, and this was touched on again yesterday, um, a real sort of common ground on a lot of agencies and advertisers agreeing that the squeeze on remuneration is actually having a detrimental impact on innovation. It's actually having a negative impact on the work that's being conducted um, between partners. So, um, so absolutely, that's something we're both agreeing that, that, that perhaps our clients are pushing too hard. Um, 
But then again, we're going to focus uh, on the disconnects a bit more today in the discussion to start, to start uh, with the panel. And the final one, uh, which I think is the biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest margin and gap, if you like, between the two parties who took part, where agency training desks are a threat to transparency. Only 8% of agencies agreed with that statement, whereas 84% of advertisers did. Now, as I said, it was referred to yesterday as a red herring, but I think that sort of gap really warrants more clarity. And the final, uh, the penultimate point I'm just going to make is actually, this isn't to say that WFA members and advertisers in general do not see the opposite, uh, the opportunity in trading desk and DSPs. Not at all. The majority of our members we know are using trading desk and they see absolutely the opportunity within them. But there's a sizable group, and in this one we're saying 33% saying actually we're not using them. And when we asked, we said, why? Why are you not using those trading desks? I think their responses are pretty self-evident. It's transparency and it's about conflict of interest. And really there needs to be more clar clarity, more education, more understanding in this area. So those are the broad areas. And I'm going to uh, leave you with a, perhaps a bit more of a uh, conciliatory or collaborative approach, if you like. The final question that we asked was, who do you feel should do more to improve transparency in media? And obviously it's not just the agencies who kindly took part in this survey uh, or the advertisers, it's also the media owners, the media auditors uh, who, who are party uh, to this, this whole discussion. And I think uh, rather encouragingly, as with any of the best work that comes between clients and their agency partners, um, the, the, the biggest chunk of, of both parties basically saying this needs to be a team effort, this needs to be something we need to work on together. And that's really the purpose of the panel, and uh, uh, thanks again to the three WFA members who agreed to sit on this panel, it's really just the start of that discussion. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Sonu Singh, he's the editor of m, m Global. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for your presentation and for sharing the results of the WFA research. Good morning, everyone. Um, you will have to bear with the voice because I've got the festival I think, uh, this morning, uh, as uh, the rest of you, I suppose. Um, while the festival media has been discussing and sharing some great ideas, talking about new products, new technologies, and using more data, cross-platform measurement and integration, all of which is disrupting the status quo of our media ecosystem. Many of you of the agencies have been coming up to me and saying, it seems a bit strange, a bit odd, that transparency still remains a key issue for advertisers. But as Rob just showed in his presentation, that for most brand <coughs> owners, media re rebates remain the biggest stumbling block to full transparency. And that's why we're here with three global brands to discuss the issue. Let me start by introducing the panel. All these panelists, they are poachers and gamekeepers, so this should be fun. Start with Tom, the Heineken Global Media Manager, responsible for agency relations at the recently formed Global Commerce University in Heineken's head office, Amsterdam. I have Ben Jankowski, Group Head Global Media Mastercard, responsible for managing the Mastercard Investment and Marketing Communications and Ian Hutchison, chairman of the WFA Media Committee, who most of you would recognize from his record Ben Kinsa days. He has recently started in his new role as Sony Mobile. But before we start, there are some house rules. It's because a lot of agencies have been interacting with me on this issue for the past few days. What I would like to suggest is that we have some sort of audience participation. We do have mics in the auditorium, and what I would like you to do is put your hands up during our conversation here and we will take questions. And uh, we have some Twitter feeds as well, so I will take some questions from, from those of you who don't want to stand up and ask the question. Let's first grapple the issue here. Let's start with asking ourselves a question, what it is that we're talking about. It is almost like a trust you had once in your spouse, which has been ruptured. You, the clients, want to save the marriage, yet you don't know how to find a way to trust your partner. And your partner, your media agency in this case, they don't know how to make you believe what they're saying, and you keep waiting to know that your spouse is being honest and therefore transparent with you. 
but neither of you probably want the breakdown of the marriage. Is this fundamentally the issue we're talking about? A breakdown of trust and clients not finding a way to mend that rupture? What is the problem here? Shall we start with you, Tom? I, I wouldn't characterise it like that, actually. I think uh, that this, is, this is a commercial relationship, isn't it? It's not a family relationship, it's See? unconditional love. It's, it's, a, it's, you know. it's a commercial relationship. I, I think um, the, the, the canon should still be trust. But for me, transparency is not an end in itself. It's a, it's a means to an end. It's a means to trust. It's an enabler of trust. Uh, for, for me, there, there are two specific um, conditions, if you like, that, that transparency can address. One is it, it, it looks to reveal income streams the agency is making. That, that's very important to my um, purchasing colleagues. Uh, we, we want to know that we've agreed that uh, some works for the agency that rewards them well, but we want to ensure that that's what they're earning and, and not significantly more. So uh, there's a, an income stream piece. There's, a, there's also uh, the potential for hidden income streams to compromise neutrality, and that's what is even more scary. Uh, if, I, if I'm going to see a doctor about a life-threatening condition, I want to know he's giving me the, the, the best treatment to, to solve that condition, not the one that might give him the best margin for it because he's friends with the for it or whatever. So the, 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 those are the two strands, if you like, that transparency can address. But the bigger issue is to try and have mutual objectives. That, that's when you, you can work together. Uh, if you're trying to achieve the same thing, then, then transparency can become an enabler to high performance rather than a deterrent to petty pilfering or whatever. What about uh, you then? No, I think, sorry, I think that some of the things that we've talked about for two days, I mean, the, the exciting part of our business of how there's never been a better time for media agencies um, because it fills a gap that we certainly need um, and all the changes in, in the marketplace. Technology, data, we talk about data and, and I think that right now we've spent a lot of time there are a lot of people, in the, you know, a lot of marketers who think that that has been used in, in the case of trading desks and things like that kind of at a, at a disadvantage. So I think that there's a huge opportunity for us to grow and spend a lot of time growing our business and doing cool, innovative things, which we all want. But also one of the themes yesterday, and somebody mentioned on the CEO panel, trust. And I think when you look at some of the data that Rob showed in the charts, when you talk about when you have such a big gap between agency and advertisers' perceptions of whether transparency is an issue, um, and whether agency, um, you know, whether agency profits are an enable, you know, are a detriment to um, to business. You know, it's difficult when you look at agency profits. The average holding company uh, profit growth last year was something like thirty percent. Now, any marketer out there going to raise their hand and say they grew their profits thirty percent last year? There probably aren't many. Um, you know, so it's difficult. It's difficult for us to look at that model and say, um, you know, that, that we really need to find. Um, you know, some middle ground. And there's a lot of solutions. So, you know, we, we, you know, agencies and, and, and advertisers need to find a way to kind of come together. There are solutions. There's third-party auditing, which I'm sure we're most of us are familiar with. There are just more time and diligence that we just have to spend together. But I think it's just the kind of the spirit, I think Rob talked about it, the spirit of this is the beginning of a conversation. I hope we can spend less time on the, you know, discussing the, the perception of the, the petty pilfering or whatever you want to call it to, Let's kind of put that, park that, and let's kind of move on and do bigger and better things. Well, how are you? I think it's about solution neutrality, actually. Um, if I had a brand that, that, uh, that wasn't working um, and that needed some, some, let's say, some surgery to fix it, I, I think I would probably want my agency to be able to come to me and say, um, I don't think you should do anything with this brand at the moment. I think you should leave it. I think you should uh, should fix the brand issues. And when you fix the brand issues, I think you should move on and start advertising, um, whatever that form of advertising is. Uh, at the moment, I, I'm not entirely convinced I would ever get that advice because I'm not sure that the way that our, our relationship is structured allows for us to get advice on spending nothing and the agency getting paid. Um, and I think if there was a way we could structure that the agency got paid for the advice they gave and the results that they delivered, we would completely eradicate the issue of transparency. But isn't that to say you almost get the agencies you deserve? So where does that onus lie? Who sets the... Who sets the the, the, the agenda. Who 
takes a responsibility because there is an issue of, of both transparency and accountability as, as well. I, I think both the agency and the client are accountable for the brand. I mean, obviously, ultimately, the, the client is, is accountable. Um, you know, the buck stops with the client. But the, the agency, if they are uh, if they are in the room advising, they are also accountable for the advice that they give. Um, and that advice needs to be completely solution neutral. Sometimes we need to be told um, it's a bad idea to support this brand. You should really think about doing it in a completely different way. And the way that we have commercial relationships structured at the moment, I'm not sure delivers that result. And do you think that's across the board? That's, that's the kind of relationship that you have with, with it's, your it's an interesting point you raise. It's the old Chinese doctor one, isn't it? You pay them when you're well, and you, uh, you don't pay them when you're ill, so it's in their interest to keep you well. But you, you need to have a different remuneration model. It's, a, it's an interesting, interesting thought. Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about remuneration models, and I think that everybody, every marketer is willing to, you know, pay for success. And to some degree, you know, we get, you know, you get what you pay for, right? If you, you know, if you, you know, don't have a productive, profitable relationship, and I don't think that we're suggesting that we don't want a partner to be profitable. It's just how do we manage, you know, how do we manage that? And, and, and you know, when you have a lot of different factors that just seem, you know, we spend too much time kind of chasing around the, you know, the, you know, sort of the, you know, the trading desk and, and rebate part of the conversation. We just spend too much time with it. If it were more, you know, open and out there, it'd be more, we'd, just, we'd be more productive. But surely, when. There's, there's a time when you're pushing for more innovation, better targeting, and efficient buying. But then you're saying, do you not want to pay for it? Or do, nothing comes for free, surely. Um, do you not want your media agencies to make money? I think we're being provoked a little bit of Twitter, Twitter feed a little bit. Yeah, we're pushing the feed around. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, how did you tweet that for the end of the chair? <laughs> the question was that you don't expect everything to come for free. Surely there are costs attached to, to uh, if, if you are pushing your agencies to perform uh, what you want them to do, and they need to put money back into innovation, into, into staff, into, into uh, uh, talent. Absolutely, and I think there's always a, there's always a role for, um, I think it's just, you want to take it down to the base level, I would say there's three levels of remuneration going on at the moment. There is the, there's the base fee, the paper performance, and then the, uh, the rebate. Um, my concern is always that the rebates make up a far larger proportion of the remunerations that, that, that the agencies take, um, and therefore there is no neutrality in the, uh, in the advice that I get. I don't know if you're paying an agency. I think the issue is most marketers won't object to paying anything. Most, not all, um, most don't object to paying anything. But when you've got the, like, when, when you don't know, when it's not transparent of what all the elements are, that's when we start having problems. Can I say, I'm actually quite surprised that here, you know, top three global brands, which for most agencies would be termed as vanity clients, and for you to be saying, what I'm saying is that for most global clients, that would not per se be, be an issue. I mean, if you look at the WFA survey, I mean, there's obviously a difference of an opinion of, you know, what people think about the, you know, what people think about those issues. So if you, if you go, go to the red herring of only 8% of agencies, but 84% of advertisers see trading desks a threat. So what is the value proposition of trading desks and what do they bring to the, to the table? Are we talking about rules of engagement? Is that the buyer seller dynamic? I, I have one specific issue with trading desks. I think they're, they're absolutely right. Um, we're getting some Twitter feeds about procurement as well. You know, procurement guys use trading desks of the sort as well for doing their, their normal everyday procurement. Um, I think the procurement, the, the trading desks are absolutely fine. The problem I've got at the moment with most, I think all, um, and if anyone has, out there has one that doesn't do this, uh, I'd love to see them, is that they, they bid the price up. And if you're acting as an agency on my behalf, you should be working to drive my price down, not bid my price up. Um, so, I, you know, everyone knows that I, I built my own trading desk of sorts. It's, it's not really a trading desk, it's a bit of an Excel on steroids, but it's, um, it, its objective was to bid the price down, not bid the price up. So I think that, that for me is the issue, which is why I think you have the dichotomy of the client saying, yes, we love trading desks. No, we don't like them bidding the price up. We're getting lots of lots of stuff on uh, on procurement as well. 
you want to Yes, would you like to start? I was, I was about to ask one of the questions about the film. What, what is your view? I think, I, I think procurement gets a, a, a bad rap. In when some you actually cases. bring the procurement guys, it should all, all the that. time, they're continuously, continuously involved, involved in the process. I mean, we, we talk about a, 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 a sort of distinction between efficiency and effectiveness. So it's the, the procurement people's role to, to drive efficiency, and it's our role on the commercial side to drive effectiveness. But it's, it's, not, it's not always separate strands, we, we work together. But I think good, good procurement people can help the process work really well. I think bad procurement people can destroy relationships. So it depends what kind of procurement people you have. No, I mean, I think procurement brings a discipline and rigor into the side of the business that, you know, that marketers found they needed and, and they're here to stay. And the challenge is, the opportunity is to bring those guys closer together. It doesn't have to be, it's not a, you know, it's not a, you know, a polar opposite agenda. It's like, you know, how do you work together within the marketing organization? How do you take your person, guys who I work with on a, you know, on a daily basis? Who How, how do we work together to kind of drive the same mission? Um, yeah, I, think, I, I think there are good procurement people and bad procurement people. Um, I also think there are good agency people and bad agency people, good clients and bad clients. Um, I think if you have a good procurement person, uh, they will understand the business. They will take counsel from the people they're working with. They will understand the business and they will do a good job of procuring. Um, and, and, and I don't see any reason for not involving procurement if that is the requirement within your, your client company. If we were to talk about the, the, the use of the auditors as well, one of the criticisms that, that comes against auditors is they sometimes take a softer line towards agencies by adjusting the, their benchmarks to accommodate more and more uh, discretionary uh, premium. Obviously meaning that almost uh, all clients enjoy superior value against whatever norm might, might have been set. Um, while some clients may be handing back bonus payments uh, to agencies which scarcely deserve them. Do you have a view about this? I mean, I, th I think you introduced a couple sides of the, the auditing relationship, which I don't necessarily... I mean, I think third-party auditing is extremely valuable, extremely effective. We've found cases when I've been both on both the agency side and the advertiser side. It's a good grounding point to begin the conversation about how do we measure success and how do we drive, how do we drive change. I mean, I'm not going mean, to... I don't have, you know, I don't have a perception that there's anything beyond, you know, using auditing to ground us in what the situation is and how we can develop action plans moving oh. forward to get into whole, how they adjust pools and things like that. So that's not my experience, but I think they're valuable parts of the equation to help us get, you know, a point in time to, you know, move the, you know, move the discussion on. What about you, Tom? I, I was just hoping that I think we've got some auditors in the audience and yeah. some questions from the audience, if, if we may. Um, you, know, you asked me about the general role of, yeah. of I mean, I, I, I think auditors are, are essential. I think it's, you can still, it's not like putting a private detective on to follow your wife around. You know, I, the first time I suggested using an auditor to the marketing director, he said, I, I don't see how I can win here, that either uh, they find nothing and I've wasted my money, or they find that my agency's been cheating me. So he, he, he saw it as a, a kind of lose-lose, but it, we, he, he was persuaded to go with it, and it worked really well. The, the, the auditor um, did it with uh, sensitivity, <laughs> found some money that actually the agency had been apparently trying to pay us back, but we couldn't raise the PO or whatever. So the, the, we, we got a lot of money back from the process, they went through the, 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 the contract, and they found that actually the agency was performing very well, but we got money back as well. So it can be a very productive experience. What about you, you Ian? Because one of the um, tweets here says about education. That's what needs to be done, especially when talking about procurement. And, um... Um, yeah, I think that's on that's on the agenda is education, um, and, and uh, I, I wouldn't want to um, say blow the gaff on some of the stuff that Charlie and WFA have been talking about. Maybe that um, I wanted also to address the the, um, the, the auditing issue. Um, I have been asked in the past to take audit clauses out of contracts, um, and I have been offered incentives by agencies, not in an improper way, but from a contractual point of view to take all the clauses out to disintermediate the auditors from the process. Um, I have to question why I would even be offered that. And is that an experience that you two have had as well? No. no. 
One thing I wanted to do, one question, and this kind of bugs me, there was one tweet a little while ago about do we, do, do marketers mind paying agencies fair wages? And I think that the issue is, by and large, can't speak for everybody, by and large, there's no issue with paying for success, you know, paying for great ideas and things like that. When you, when there's uncertainty about I'm going to pay you X and then you're going to earn Y through other channels, that's the uncertainty. It's not a matter of we're trying to avoid paying agencies. We just need to find a way to kind of get together to figure out the you know, new model so that we're all, you know, so we see everything's on the table at the same time, not just what's on the table and then we don't know what else is happening in other, in other streams. So that, that, that tweet kind of, you know, it's, it's not an issue of we're not the objective of the panel. The, I think most of the members of the WFA would say this is an exercise. I'm like, oh, i got to try to find ways to, you know. Margins, but that being the, the core focus over value and performance. Do you think that might be the sort of slippery slope that agencies found themselves during the days of 15% discount? Because I think that there's, there's a stat here that between, this is, this is the UK only stat, between 2000 and 2009, 40% of UK budgets in Q4 uh, were in pitch. So a mad race to guess an ever increasing discount. Is that even sustainable? Yeah. I, I would I would answer that with uh, maybe a little storytelling about um, a law that was put in place in France. Um, I think it was 1997, 98, something like that, called the And the Wassafin was put in place um, not because agencies were making 15% or 20% or their agency revenue stream was under threat because it had fallen to 12 or 10 or 3 or they were doing it for zero, but because some of those buys were generating 90 and 95% incomes. Um, that's why it was put in place and the last of power was put in place to deliver transparency in the marketplace. Um, I, I, I think it's a new discussion about how much the agencies earn. Um, I, I think they do well. So. Um, one of the questions I can see is about discussing the value of having a planning agency place a buy on advertising for the holding company's trading desk. What's, uh, what are your views on that? Because they are obviously supposed to be act network agnostic. Is that how? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not, I, I saw the question I was trying to figure out. I mean, with respect, I was trying to figure out what the question was. I mean, I think that we work with, we understand the dynamics of individual parts of the holding company and, and, and the value of you know, rolling up the issue. I don't think that anybody has issues with one agency entity doing one piece of the work and then having a, you know, having the you know having the holding company, you know, buying conglomerate buy the work. I don't think there's any issues I don't think there's any issues with that actual like the mechanics of that. Um, I don't I'm not sure I understood the, I'm not sure I understood the question. I don't know if you guys have a different view. Yeah, I saw it too. I don't know whether it, it implies that somehow it's too cozy a relationship or right. whatever, that you're unlikely to get best value. I'm not, I'm not sure what, what maybe. Love for a follow up. I, I know we're not answering I, the question. I, I so think perhaps, I, I don't know if, if, if you are in the audience and you, you might like to uh, elaborate a bit, but I would imagine that perhaps what uh, the question being asked here is that you, you have a holding company owns, owns a trading desk. What is it to say that, say, a 24 year old? Um, a boy who is looking after your, uh, your account is not told by the holding desk to go uh, by, by the holding company to go to the trading desk owned by the holding company. What is to say that, as you said, that, that there isn't a close relationship? How, how this, comfortable or confident are you? This whole thing comes back to trust, doesn't it? If, if you fundamentally, look, if you've got to the stage of putting a private detective, you know, follow your wife, it's probably kind of beyond. Anyway, isn't it? So it, 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 